welcome to episode two of Terrace Talk. I'm Connor Southall, joined by two new guests. They're not Archant employees this week, so we've uh, stretched beyond our office and we've ventured outside of our office. You might be able to see Carra Road in the background. We're currently set on a very pleasant bench in Carra Park, um, which is very nice. To my right, Ben Ambrose. Ben, first and foremost, how are you? I'm very well, mate. Good to see you again. How's life treating you? It's all right. It's all right. Good. Thoughts on Norwich at the moment? Just a brief overview. In, let's, get, let's have a one-word answer, actually. Oh, a one-word answer. Yeah. Pending. Okay. In, that's that's quite a quite a good choice for you. Terry Westgate as well, uh, EDP columnist, I think these I days. I am, yes. So yeah. you, you ventured into the uh, the mainstream media. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. And uh, how are you feeling about Norwich at the moment? In one word. Yeah, let's go one word oh, again. Actually, um, yeah. See if you can beat pending. Challenging. 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 Nice. I like that. They're quite. Uh, quite thoughtful words I think to, to start us off um, we're going to start with a little bit of uh, different thing we're going to go a bit quick fire about the, the guys um, experience as, as fans and I'm going to ask them a few little questions so you sort of get a bit of a, a picture about those guys and how they support the club so Ben let's start with you are you ready I've put, I've put yeah, you sure. right on the yeah, spot yeah, here sure. I'm ready. Um, but we'll, we'll have a go we'll see how this works um, first and foremost tell yep. us where you sit in the ground uh, I sit in the river end uh, lower, lower tier at the front row, sort of between the Gerald and the Gulf. But yeah, it's a lovely, lovely seat. And I do love the River End. I thought you were going to give us your seat number then. Yeah. Uh, who do you go to football with? I'll go with my father. First game? 2007, I think it was. We beat Southampton 2-1 at home, I think. Favourite game? Oh, it's got to be Ipswich 3-1. How can it not be? And a uh, bit of a, a niche one. I want to go for your favourite player who isn't like, who you wouldn't consider a legend. So perhaps a... A strange player that or you, you in have history or now, just whenever you like. No city though. Obviously. Well, at the moment, I'll go at the moment. Marco Stiepman, mm-hmm. always. You, um, you know I love him. And let's go past as well. I think I know the answer to this. Do you? Yeah. Oh right. Oh, are we going Robbie Brady? Yeah. Yeah, Robbie Brady. Love him. <laughs> <laughs> any, any particular reason? No, just no. love him. Okay. Well, that, that's fine by us. Uh, and finally, let's let's get if you've got any perhaps pre-match rituals prior to coming to Carrow Road any strange things that you have to do on a match day um, that you think you know, we know footballers are very superstitious people the fans are also do you, do you have any strange rituals that, that you perform prior to coming here there are two it's the left left sock before the right sock and also I've dropped it now but back in the promotion winning season with Alex Neal it was a curly whirly before every game <laughs> didn't, didn't, know, didn't have one before Middlesbrough at home we lost 1-0 right. so I thought I'd got to have one before Wembley yeah. we won at Wembley so I'm not saying it's my fault but <laughs> lovely there you go you've, you've survived the quick fire questions Terry your turn now cool uh, whereabouts do you sit on the ground lower Barclay block D back row lovely very precise love yep. that um, first game Watford 1990 League Cup lovely do you go to football with anyone um, kind of meet friends yeah so I kind of go on my own but meet friends at football or, or in the pub obviously favourite game by Munich away lovely yeah can't complain that one <laughs> no. can you uh, let's ask you the same question then favourite niche player that perhaps people wouldn't assume not like the hula hands and holts of this yeah, world yeah my favourite player was always John Paulson. you know or I like a defender hence probably why Zimbo is my favourite player at the moment but yeah John Paulson is the only name I've ever had on the back of my shirt really yeah Interesting. Have you have you got any strange rituals like putting your left sock on before you right? No. Do you know what? All the all of that went out the window last year because yeah. we just kept winning whatever happened. <laughs> the only thing that I still do and I always do is go through turnstile thirteen. Always have to. If it's not open yet, I sit and wait for that turnstile to open before I get in the ground. Brilliant. They're they're really interesting. Uh, I'm going to throw my father under the bus a little bit here, but uh, I remember him saying it in the FA Cup. If uh, he used to wear the same outfit if Norwich won. Um, just in the FA Cup very strange uh, if, you've, if you've got a funny little ritual get it in down below we'd like to hear it um, let's talk about football then Norwich City coming off the uh, back of a nil-nil draw at Bournemouth Terry let's, let's get your thoughts were you there first and foremost no no, no I wasn't I was listening to Radio Norfolk at home um, my thoughts well you can read it in the pinken obviously <laughs> uh, my column That's was published what, yesterday it? but um, I think just relieved A to get a point to get a clean sheet when we literally didn't have any central defenders on the pitch at the end of the match, I think, was an achievement. Um, and I think players are coming back from injury now. I think this might be, hopefully, a turning point after those three nasty defeats on the bounce. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the Man U game. Did it inject some 
optimism because obviously after that Aston Villa game I think everyone was feeling uh, a bit down in the dumps and a bit gloomy during that international break and then to have a result like that it almost proved that they could do the ugly side of the game and Daniel Farker could set them up in a pragmatic way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Villa was a bit of a fluke result. I don't actually think they were 5-1 good, Villa, and we were 5-1 bad. It was just one of those fluke results. It's just everything they hit went in. Um, I think, obviously, we were missing defenders, but we were also crucially missing our two defensive midfielders in that game. And they were both back at the weekend, so that brought a lot of grit and determination, I think, back into the squad. So, yeah, I think we can definitely get the points a dirty way if we need to. Ben, I know your knowledge on Bournemouth is uh, extensive. Yeah. Um, how, how do you feel about the result first and foremost obviously quite a pleasing one I would imagine after after the Aston Villa game yeah I think it's one of them games that you definitely want to get something out of and if we're not going to win I think we did the second best thing which was a clean sheet and I think to have Tim Krul back who as you know I think a lot of people know is so so important for us it was it was really good for him and I think that's our first in the league this season and it's just it's so important for confidence and I think definitely going into Man United I'm, I'm optimistic but you know at the worst of times I'm a blind optimist but <laughs> definitely going into Man United yeah I'm, I'm very very positive Terry touched upon it there but uh, Alex Tetty his, yeah. his inclusion back into the side sort of seen a, a shape shift almost uh, resemble more of a 4-1-4-1 particularly out of possession um, how crucial is keeping Alex Tetty fit? Because I, I remember there being a point probably a season or two ago where I kind of thought I can't imagine Norwich playing well without Alex Tetty in the team is that something that you still think is the case can they play without Alex Tetty or is he just an added bonus I think he's an added bonus I think he's like he's done a bit of a hula hand he's sort of aged like a fine wine and I think when Daniel Farker first came in there was questions can he really play this sort of football but we've really seen him develop his game and you see Tetty on the ball he passes the ball forward he's he's really good he's got a bit of technicality about him but I think he's definitely definitely improved but I'm not going to say we can't play without him because I think that would be a bit Absurd. Yeah, a bit drastic, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I kind of noted how simple Alex Tetty's game is under Daniel Farker, how it isn't perhaps winning a tackle and then firing a 40-yard pass into the distance. You know, it, it was all very simple in terms of five yards. Just that, how important is it to get the best out of him and to utilise his qualities in the Premier League? Because he's not going to be a player who's going to get loads of assists. No, he's not. That's not his role. His role is to be in front of the back line, to break up play, to stop the attackers coming forward from the opposition. And then he gives the ball to the playmaker. That's his role. And you really notice when he's not there and that job is not being done, that's when we suddenly become really exposed at the back and that's when we defend. So although it looks like he's just doing a dirty job, it's a really important job. And when he's not there, you notice the difference. And even playing, well, I think it was uh, about... 40, 40 minutes yeah. I think if I'm not mistaken as a centre back that takes some doing for, for a guy who has just come back from injury is starting his first game and then has to play a completely new position I know it's brilliant isn't he yeah that was amazing I mean I think we all hearts are in our mouths when we saw that Godfrey was going off it's like that's it our one last central defender is now crocked how on earth are we going to get through this but the fact that he managed to step up and luckily we had Tribal on the bench to come on and he stepped up and he managed to help us keep that clean sheet and I, I think it is really important that clean sheet that we got at the weekend Absolutely massive for confidence, if, uh, if anything else. Yeah, definitely. I think after the three defeats, the one thing we need is our confidence back because we've seen there are a lot of confidence-based players. For example, Todd Cantwell is a massive example. But to get a clean sheet and, you know, arguably we could have won that game. I think Pookie had a massive chance, which um, forced a great save from... Ramsdale. Ramsdale, that's the one. But, um, but yeah, I think definitely that'll, that'll give the team a lot of confidence. And I think, again, I think we'll do all right against Man United. Do you think it was almost a, the response they needed to give? Uh, I think Chris Sutton put out a, an article which you, you were all asking us to comment on last week uh, <laughs> about how Norwich were effectively sitting ducks def- defensively. Do you think this performance almost reaffirms that they, they, they can defend, they can do the pragmatic side of the game and they can be a bit ugly and a bit nasty if need be? I think Tim Krul said to uh, Dave Freezer, and I think it's all available on, on the pink end, um, about how Norwich had to give away the nasty fouls and the professional fouls and be a bit... Um, slyer I suppose in how they played the game do you think this was almost a response to those critics I think it was for the team but I think for Daniel Farker himself as well to sort of answer these questions can he put out a team that can defend in the Premier League he's answered them saying yes like which is clear in the fact we've got a clean sheet away from home against the sort of prominent goal scoring side but um, as far as I'm aware it was a it was a 4-1-4-1 setup wasn't it which I think is sort of popular with Daniel Farker I think he influenced it early on in his Norwich days but definitely I think we can defend in the Premier League it can be done quite easily I think you've got the whole argument with the fullbacks being too high leaving us too open but you know if you don't have the fullbacks up high how do we play our expansive football but definitely I think we can um, we can build on it Is it about balance and, and finding that balance in the Norwich team? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think, obviously, injuries upset that because suddenly a lot of options in the same position suddenly went. And I think that's one of the reasons that we we lost those three games. We lost every, you know, defensive midfielders and central defence. That's a really key part of the pitch. And all those players were suddenly out. And we, that's where I think the balance was upset. Whereas now we've got some of those players back. We're still short on central defenders, unfortunately. But now there are more options. So... Farker has different things that he can do and he can adapt more to different styles of play and different situations within the game. He's not forced to play just the, the set 11. And that's been it, isn't it? Because effectively he's been putting out the team that he's had to play out of necessity rather than choice. He's had almost one hand tied behind his back with those options at least coming back onto the bench. Not only does it lift the mood amongst the squad as well as the supporters, but it gives him far more options to, to tinker with and play with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like having O'Neill back and coming off the bench at the weekend, I mean, that was such a lift, wasn't it? Knowing that you've got somebody with that kind of pace who can come onto the pitch towards the end of a game. And Rancic hopefully might be back soon. So suddenly you've got all these options again, whereas before we were having to fill the bench with, you know, academy players and under-23s because we just didn't have the numbers. And how nice is it to have those players back? It's not, I, I'll tell you now, it's nice to sit in a press conference and hear about players coming back rather yeah. than getting a list of players out. So does it um, give you more optimism, more hope after the weekend? Or is, it, is there still underlying issues for you that you need to see Norwich um, sort of deal with on, on a regular basis? I think going into the Bournemouth game, seeing the list of people that were back, I was suddenly filled with a lot more optimism. But I, like talking about injuries, you can't not, say that our performances have been affected by them because you know behind the scenes on the pitch there is absolutely no way that that amount that sheer velocity of injuries cannot influence a performance but I think definitely going into Man United again with all these players back you said Vrancic I think he'll be a key one because I think we've seen in the past in the championship he's he's definitely got Premier League quality Um, Onel Hernandez again uh, such an important player I think we sort of lacked that pace down the size because I know we've got Buendia who is a natural winger but he's not naturally got that pace he can't knock it around a player and sprint past him can he um, Todd Cantwell as well can't really do that so having Hernandez back sort of brings that sort of variety which I'm sure Daniel Fark will be rubbing his hands in delight at Was your heart in your mouth when Ben Godfrey went off? Yeah I was I had no idea what was going to happen like I, someone told me someone just said Ben Godfrey's come off I was like what on earth is going to happen and Teddy plays in centre back and we keep a clean sheet I mean that is a footballing miracle. <laughs> well, I suppose the good news is that uh, we, we spoke to Ben Goffrey yesterday um, as we're filming this and uh, he's revealed he's fit for Sunday. So yeah. massive news. Um, let's talk about the other guy in central defence, Ibrahim Amadou. Not a natural central defender, but uh, last Saturday showed exactly what he can do. I think his performances for Norwich have been a bit hit and miss, if you know what I mean. Because obviously he's not naturally a centre-back, is he? But Man City, he was a colossus in the back, wasn't he? And I think Villa, the away games, he struggled a bit. But then again at Bournemouth, he was very, very good. So he's proven that he has it about him, which I think pushed a bit further forward. He can really play his own game. But definitely the fact he's come into the club, signed as a really promising defensive midfielder, and he's ha- like quite happily played centre-back, and arguably quite well for a non-natural defender. He, he's just been superb for me. What do you make of Ibrahim Amadou? Yeah, I agree. I think one of the things that you look at the games where he did well, that's when he's had experienced people around him because he's not an experienced defender. But when he's got Krull behind him and he's got somebody in midfield like Teti in front of him, then he performed really well. But as soon as, like Villa, we had so many with McGovern in goal and your people injured all over the pitch, suddenly I think he was a bit more exposed because you kind of need somebody there to hold the line. You need somebody, either a keeper behind to let them know what's happening or somebody like a Teddy in front to, de- to help protect the defenders. But if he's got that support, then he's proven that he can do that job. And when you think that is not what we signed him for, and yet he's, mm. like I said, at the weekend, came away with a clean sheet, is a, a massive... I mean, I'd like to see what it's actually like in the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all can't wait for if that. He's gonna, if that's how good he is out of position, how good is he going to be when he's in the right position? Well, we, perhaps uh, we'll be talking about Ibrahim Amadou and not Alex Teddy's influence. Um, Let's, let's touch a little bit on Bournemouth then. Were you surprised by how they played? They were, they were quite direct for me. I was, I was a little bit surprised at that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you never really, I, mean I don't really know what to expect. I'm one of these people that, um, as a, when I'm a Norwich City supporter, I only follow the leagues that Norwich are in. Right. Okay. <laughs> so last season, I didn't really watch much Premier League football because, you know, it didn't affect me. So you come into the Premier League with all these kind of preconceptions of what teams are like and how they're going to play. And I think they, they do surprise you. And I think like Burnley surprised me as well. I went to Burnley for that game. And everybody was like, oh, they're just a, you know, a dirty team that would just kind of kick the ball on. And they play some good football. And I think perhaps with Bournemouth, it's the other way around. I think sometimes you do have these preconceptions. But the thing about teams like Burnley and Bournemouth is that they've been in the Premier League for a while and they know what they need yeah. to do to stay there. So they probably change their game to, you know, for the environment. 
Yeah, that's that's a fantastic point you make there in terms of their stability. Daniel Farker said on, on Friday, I think the press conference before, that um, Norwich could use Bournemouth almost as a role model in terms of, OK, different style of play and different on the pitch, but in terms of how they've established themselves off the pitch, you've got a perfect template there to try and replicate. Yeah, definitely. I think well, with Norwich have got, um, obviously the way we came up was brilliant and the way we kind of stormed to the, the league title, but there's a lot of inexperience both in the players and in the management about performing at this level so I think they're going to learn they're obviously going to want to play one way but how you stay in the league is how to, to adapt and I think he's proven that he already had been forced to adapt because of all the injuries and there'll be other situations where you'll be losing a game and the system's not working and you have to try something different and you know that's when we'll find out how good Daniel Farker really is. Absolutely Ben I'm, I'm going to change um, the topic slightly we've, we've just, we've just <laughs> no, we've, we, I, I think we've covered Bournemouth now and that's, uh, I'm sure people will, will shout at us if we're wrong um, I want to talk a little bit about Patrick Roberts because he's an interesting case obviously signed from Manchester City on loan in the summer came with quite a lot of pedigree after a, a decent two year spell at Celtic had a year at uh, Girona in Spain they, they obviously got relegated um, perhaps didn't feature as much as he would like and, and got an injury came to Norwich and some people were expecting him to uh, to have quite a major impact yeah. yet on Friday night we see him starting for the under 23s and that gives us a real indication that he's not in Daniel Farker's plans for Bournemouth what does it say to him given that pretty much as soon as Onel Hernandez is, uh, is back fully training he finds himself in the under 23s as opposed to on the bench I think it's a pretty safe bet when a player is being excluded from the squad that there's a, like, a suitable reason for it. I think you look at Nelson Oliveira as a prime example. Daniel Farker knows how to man-manage quite well. So my natural assumption is there's something going on. Maybe he's not working hard enough in training. Maybe his attitude's wrong. But in terms of the signing, I think he fit the bill a lot for Norwich because he was sort of a player who lost his way a bit, a lot of promise. Um, I think the only difference between him and a lot of Norwich signings is everyone knew who he was, which is perhaps where the baggage comes from. Perhaps if we'd not had heard of him before, then people wouldn't be raising their eyebrows. But for me personally, I think he's just another player who's lost his way a bit, needs to be managed the right way, and hopefully he doesn't sort of become another Marcus Edwards. Yeah, I, that, that was my next point in terms of Marcus Edwards. Um, that was obviously a sign that didn't go well. And, and for as much as we talk about Norwich City and, and positive recruitment, decent recruitment in terms of the, uh, the body of players they've brought in since uh, Stuart Webber and, and Daniel Farker came in, I guess the supporters will be hoping... Patrick Roberts isn't another one that falls into that Marcus Edwards mould. I think he's got a, a bit more of a chance at it because he's been signed in the summer, whereas I think Edwards came late January, yes. didn't he? So perhaps you know he didn't have as much time to adapt. But I have every piece of faith that Daniel Farker will coach him into the right player. And if he doesn't, then clearly there's an issue lying deep within him that he needs to sort out. But he's, he's, I think he's relatively low risk because, as you said, we've got Buendia, we've got Hernandez, we've got Campwell, we've got wide players who want to play there. So if he if it doesn't work, then it's going to fall back. What are your thoughts on uh, Patrick Roberts? It's an intriguing case, isn't it? It is intriguing. Um, I agree. If Daniel Farke doesn't think he should be in the team, then that's right. And I know you talk about recruitment and you're always trying to get the right people, but I suppose you're never really going to know about a person's attitude and how they're going to fit in with the squad. I mean, it's a team game. It's not about individuals. And the reason that we've been so successful in recent seasons is because we've had players that maybe have underachieved but have come together and become a greater whole and you can see the real camaraderie there is between the players and you don't want anybody in there who's going to upset that so yes he probably is a good player and I'm still hopeful you know there's still a long way in the season to go he could still feature and actually play quite a key role in what happens but when it's ready you know when the time is ready and when Daniel thinks he's ready. Yeah, I think, I think the last time we heard Daniel Farker speak about him, he said he uh, was a little bit tired, which is um, interesting. And, and maybe perhaps he struggled to, to adapt with almost the physicality and the intensity of coming to Norwich City, a, a Premier League club, a newly promoted club. Clearly in training, there's going to be a lot of players, I'm getting attacked by a leaf, <laughs> lots of players who, who want to impress and get into Daniel Farker's thoughts. Yeah, and a lot of people have said since Daniel Farker came in that the training has been up. So it's, it's I think they train like twice as much as they used to do. And you can imagine if you've not used to that, that's probably going to... If it's not what he was expected, maybe. Maybe that's something. I don't know. I don't know what the reason is, but there's clearly a very good reason. But hopefully, you know, there's time he can adapt and he can still, you know, feature in the team. Yeah, I think it's massively important we don't completely write off Patrick Roberts. Yeah. We've played, what, nine games uh, the 10th on Saturday against Manchester United, which we'll, we'll come on to shortly. Um, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because if you look at Stuart Webber's recruitment and, and uh, Kieran Scott, and then we're now fighting a lawnmower, which is great. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you look at their recruitment... Um, Almost the players that have come domestically and, and the homegrown players, so to speak, I'm thinking Marley Watkins, yeah. uh, Marcus Edwards, as, as you rightly said, haven't worked 
quite as much as, as the foreign talent. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think Ben Marshall is another example. Yeah, I think yeah. there's there's a lot of that type of player in and around. Sometimes it works, sometimes they don't. I think it's, it's a really interesting one. As you said, I'm not going to write Patrick Roberts off straight away because, as I said, I've got faith in the, the coaching team to get something out of him. But it is, it's certainly an interesting point. And I think, as I've literally just said, Ben Marshall is a, a prime example. I think everyone knew who he was. He sort of came with a bit of baggage because of his name and it didn't really work out whether that'll be the same for Patrick Roberts who knows because I think he's a bit younger than uh, than Ben Marshall but it's certainly an interesting one that I cannot predict yeah it's it's really interesting uh, when we spoke to Stuart Weber about signing his new contract and he, he pointed towards the mistakes he made he always said he pretty much said look the signings I've made domestically haven't quite paid off so um, I, I think off the top of my head I'm thinking Angus Gunn Harrison Reed, Jordan Rhodes and they, they were all loan signings yeah. um, and, and perhaps beyond that unless I, I can be stand, stood corrected I, I don't think there's anyone else who's made too much of an impact in terms of domestic signings I can't think of any off the top of my head I think it's okay for Stuart Webber to like own up to his mistakes because it was never going to be sort of a clean swoop in terms of domestic signings and what have you but it was you know there was always going to be a few bad eggs a few players who just don't work out which is okay because you know we've got a man in Stuart Webber who's going to open up and sort of speak about his mistakes that he's made which I think is really refreshing at the club we've not had anything like that at the club in a very long time but you know as, as you said sometimes it works sometimes they don't I think it's as simple as that but you know Patrick Roberts is the chance to, to put it right that's it about recruitment isn't it you can put all this work into it and, and think this player's ideal for you and then for whatever reason it doesn't quite work every signing is a gamble isn't it yeah, always is. And I say, like I say, you don't know how they're going to interact with the other players. You don't know how they're going to fit into the system. But I don't think with the... I mean, obviously, we've got the be- we had the best free transfer in history in Team Ipuki. I don't think we can really criticise our recruitment. They're not going to get it right 100% of the time. But when they get it right, they get it really right. And there's going to be a few that fall by the wayside. But I, I, I challenge you to find another club where that isn't the case. And even when that has been the case, if we look at that Marley Watkins example, they, they then made profit on him, signed him for free and sold him for uh, a fee to Bristol City. So that shows that even if the ones they do get wrong, they can still make profit off. Exactly. I think they know what they're talking about. I think I trust them. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, let's, uh, let's look ahead very briefly to Manchester United then. Um, I suppose probably the big question that, that I, I should ask is, um, are you as fearful of this Man United team as the one perhaps coming when Sir Alex Ferguson was in charge I think that's a pretty obvious answer well it's a no isn't it it's clearly a no and, um, and you know we did quite well against some of Alex Ferguson's teams as well in yeah. the years yeah. um, no uh, they are almost you could almost say they're prime for taking really aren't they um, I think we obviously I mean I don't expect for a moment that the players are going to think that they're going to walk this one at all um, they're still you know they've got good players they can still get results but they're no they don't have that team unit that we do they don't have that camaraderie they don't have that willing to fight you know for a tackle for for each other well we do have that and i think that will be our advantage and when you look at the attacking players that are now coming back that we've got on our side i think most norwich fans will be thinking yeah we can really get something here how are you feeling ben i'm feeling great mate you know me <laughs> but i think yeah i, I can't disfold can't fault what Terry's just said about Man United and they are, they are literally a team of individuals you look at Man United and you think oh he's decent he's decent he's decent but do they play well together at the moment certainly not but on the other hand they have just drawn with Liverpool at home which I think is a massive point for them um, but I think going into the game we should, we should be okay as Terry again said by no means necessary the Norwich player is going to think oh we're going to walk this but I, I do think they'll be up for it and I think I saw an interesting stat um, the other day about Ole on a Solskjaer's start and he had a, he's had a better start to life at Man United than Klopp did to Liverpool so with that in the back of my mind I'm thinking don't write them off just yet but I'm, I'm definitely optimistic and your question about comparing um, Fergie sides to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's sides I think there's no comparison at all in terms of fear like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side looks like a League One side compared to Fergie's so Scott McTominay and Fred don't uh, strike fear in your in your heart then. After hearing Gary Neville just dissect Fred and rip him apart, I have I've watched Fred in a different light and thought he is just not very good. Touch wood. I'm, like. gl- I'm glad you chose those <laughs> words. <laughs> yeah, Christ, yeah, but um, it'd be an interesting one. I think there's a whole other show to do on Manchester United and exactly what's gone wrong there. But in in terms of Norwich, this is a home game uh, against the side who. Uh, aren't in great form I think that's fair to say regardless of if they're Manchester United or not and we could sit here and list the individual talent but a lot of other Premier League clubs have individual talent as well 
Is the feeling among supporters that if Norwich City apply themselves and if they can get the atmosphere in this place right on Sunday, that there's another opportunity for a massive shock? Yeah, definitely. I think we want to replicate the atmosphere that we had against the Man City game, get everybody behind the team. I, I believe that our players have got enough to get a result, I really do. And I think most Norwich fans, particularly because of the form that Man United have been in, will be looking at this thinking, this is another one. You know, and this team does seem to raise itself when you play a, you know, a big team. Well, you know, we play Man City. We did really well against Chelsea as well. And even Liverpool, even when we lost, we still you know, create more chances than any other team had done in the last year. Yeah. So I think we, do, we can raise our game. We have got that individual talent that can create chances against big teams. And I think we will have that again on Sunday. And I think you know, if we get a few early chances and get the crowd really going, I think it could be another cracking match. Absolutely. Replicating that Man City atmosphere, is that going to be easy in the river end? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a question that is. I speak for everyone in the river I end. I used to sit there before I, I stuck in. Uh, we love the river end, don't we? Um, yeah, I think, I think it can be done. I think the atmosphere against Villa was like, it was a shell shock car road, as Terry said. Was it a resigned atmosphere? Because that's what it felt to me. It, it felt like it was a, a whole stadium that was sort of licking its wounds a little bit. Yeah, I, I'd agree. It, it, was, it was a really odd day because, as Terry said, it wasn't a 5-1 game, was it? I watched the highlights before. Um, coming here and I thought we've given the ball away three times for three of their goals it wasn't a 5-1 game but definitely we know the Carrow Road crowd will be bouncing um, on Sunday I think the fabulous work along Cup Norwich do will inspire uh, fans to, to crack on and be as loud as they can but yeah Carrow Road will definitely be a fortress on there on Sunday Lovely, right, let's, uh, let's end as we always should do on, on these sort of shows, I think, getting score predictions. You, you either love them or you hate them, don't you? Uh, Terry, let's start with you. What are you feeling at, at this point as we sit here on, what is it today, Wednesday? I'm saying, I, mean, well, I am an optimist, but I'm saying 3-1 Norwich. Love it, I'm, I'm sat between two optimists, I love it. Ben, what are you feeling? <laughs> uh, I'm, I was literally going to say 3-1, but I'll change up and go for 3-2 okay. to Norwich. Who's, who's going to score? Pookie 2, Hernandez come on, 91st minute. Oh, that would be all right, wouldn't it? Um, if that happens now, you just owe me a lot of money. Like, that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Well, we, we, we're not encouraging anyone to bet, but if, if you fancy Ben's odds, then, then you know where he is. Um, Terry, Ben, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, that, that, was, that was good. It wasn't too bad, was it? It wasn't too bad. You survived. Uh, hopefully, we've, we've survived over the... I don't even know what it is. Leaf blower? Because it's a, it looks like, lawnmower, it looks like a concrete... Yeah. Co- so I hope he's not cutting the grass, because that, that would be very questionable. Um, <laughs> but no, thanks, guys, uh, very much for joining me. Uh, thank you, guys, for watching, listening. Uh, wherever you uh, you dissected this uh, I know there was quite a few people who listened to this in audio form so uh, that's good to know if you'd like to come on the show as well uh, there'll be an email address uh, somewhere in the description Tony might even put it on the video as well if he if he fancies it um, so yeah thank you very much to, uh, for watching here's to Manchester United and I hope that Norwich City can uh, get a run of going of sorts I think uh, we'll see you very very soon and of course for all our content Terry's column uh, <laughs> pinkin.com is, uh, is the place to go